When I did this interview, I was in complete awe. I, in my entire life, I don't think I've ever met anyone so strong, so near to death, and then able to just use his the power of his mind and his will to overcome. His whole goal in life is not, it's not about him, it's to contribute, it's to help others. I, I just felt incredibly inspired by him. Giles Dooley is a documentary photographer. He's covered some of the worst conflicts of our time. He was a victim in one of those conflicts, Afghanistan. I could see my legs had gone. There was just uh, like a shard of bone remaining from my, my right leg. My left arm was kind of mangled and, and pretty much on fire. It was a miracle I survived that day. I was just lucky. It just wasn't my day to go. We send Giles out on assignment to photograph the lives of people affected by conflict. But he started out as a rock and roll photographer. This is his story. I'm Melissa Fleming, and this is Awake at Night. Well, you know, photography came really to me by accident. I was 18 years old. I was actually in the States um, on a sports scholarship. I was the world's worst boxer. I remember my coach giving me a very backhanded compliment. He said, Giles, you take a punch really well. But sport was my life. I loved sport. And I was involved in, in quite a minor car accident, but it damaged my knees to the extent that I was told I would never do sport again. I was flown back to the UK. I was in a hospital bed in London. And I remember I was an angry young man. I was 18 years old. I really messed up at school. I, I struggled for, through my, out my education. Um, and sport had been my life. And suddenly that had all been taken away from me. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I didn't want to go to university. But I had no direction. And then in that very low point, when I was still in hospital, my godfather, unfortunately, passed away. And when he died, he left me two things. And one was a book by the war photographer Don McCullen. And another was an Olympus OM10 camera. And these two small gifts changed my life completely. And I remember looking through these images of Don McCullen's, these black and white stark images of the Vietnam War, uh, famines in Biafra, Bangladesh. And to this day, if I shut my eyes, I can still see those images so clearly. And I knew there and then that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to tell stories like Don McCullen had. And so I taught myself photography lying in a hospital bed. I had this little Olympus camera. I used to photograph the doctors and nurses. I was 18 years old, so mainly I photographed nurses. And, and taught myself photography and left full of good intentions to follow in the footsteps of, of Don McCullen and become a war photographer. But I had a few friends that were in bands, that were musicians. And, you know, they said, well, you come and photograph our gigs and our concerts. And I did, and it was fun. And I didn't really think much more of it than that. But some magazines saw the work. And before I knew it, I was getting phone calls and, and magazines were commissioning me to travel around the world to photograph the you know, biggest rock bands of the time. And, you know, I was like 19, 20 years old. And suddenly I'm, I'm finding, you know, I'm on the road with Oasis or I'm flying to Miami to photograph Marilyn Manson or Mariah Carey. And very quickly, very quickly, my good intentions of traveling around the world to be a war photographer kind of went out the window. You know, I was suddenly in this amazing, very glamorous life. And it was a lot of fun. You know, I, I can't deny that at that point in my life, yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. But you became disillusioned at some point. What happened? You know, I started to look at the way it became more about advertising and the magazines I worked for. When I started, they used to have covers of really inspiring people. People had done something with their life. And suddenly, you know, I was being asked to photograph something because they'd been in Big Brother or, you know, a celebrity culture really started to take over. And I struggled with that. And I also struggled a lot with the way that women were represented in the magazines I worked for. It, it reached a sort of climax. I guess I was in my late 20s. And I remember I was doing a, a shoot in uh, the Charlotte Street Hotel in London. And there was an argument going on between a young actress and an editor of a magazine about whether she would be in her underwear or not. And she was quite upset and crying. And that was that kind of sudden moment. I was sat there and I saw her... And I thought, this is not why I became a photographer. This is not what I ever intended to do. And so I had a rock and roll moment. <laughs> it was reported at the time that in the middle of this shoot, I'd taken all these cameras, my tripod, all my equipment, and thrown it out the window of the Charlotte Street Hotel. It smashed in the street 
outside, like a true kind of rock and roll band member. The reality is I, I'm kind of not that rock and roll. Um, my friends kind of know me as being more of a sort of um, quiet Agatha Christie type radio person, very relaxed. And so in fact, what had happened is I just throw my cameras on the bed. I had a minor hissy fit. It was just unfortunate that they, they bounced off the bed and out the window. And so the story of me smashing my cameras was born. I was only 28 years old, but I thought that was the end of photography. I, I, I left London and I sank into really deep depression. I thought I'd wasted my opportunity in life. I left, I got a job in a, in a, in a bar at first, in a pub, um, and pretty much was drinking myself to death, was depressed, I didn't work, I didn't go out, and really, really sunk into about as deep depression as you can possibly get to and survive. How did you pull out? Well, it was at the lowest, lowest, lowest point, and I lived by the sea, and I remember really contemplating, you know, did I, did I want to carry on with my life? Uh, and I really didn't. I couldn't see any way forward. And then at the, that lowest point, I remember actually being on the beach and just contemplating whether I wanted to just walk into the sea or not. And then I said to myself, you know what? Think of yourself now as your life is over. Think of it now as a new life. And there's only one person can give you that opportunity, and that's you. And I remember I had a mantra in my head, and the mantra was, I just want a second chance. So I really, at that moment, tried to start rebuilding my life. And I got a job as a care worker. I got a job looking after a young guy called Nick, who had very severe autism. And I knew that if I didn't care about myself, which I didn't, if I didn't want to, to live for myself, which I didn't, but having somebody whose life was in my hands, somebody who every day needed my support, that gave me focus. And I've always said that to people. If, if there's a point in your life where you stop caring about yourself, then find a role where you see that somebody else needs you. What was it about caring for somebody else that spoke to you specifically? I looked after, um, say, Nick, who had very severe autism for a couple of years. And then I looked after a, a gentleman who had uh, multiple sclerosis, who was bed bound. And that was, again, one of the most humbling jobs because it's quite literally, you know, I'd have to, to wash him in mornings. He couldn't control his bowel movements. He, he was completely dependent on me. I had to feed him. Really, it's funny, we look down on care workers. In England, it's one of the lowest paid jobs you could have. And yet it's one of the most important and it's one of the most intimate things. You know, the, the great irony, of course, is that when I was injured, I had to, to go through it myself. When I was injured, I you know, lost both my legs and my arm, but my right hand was smashed to pieces, so it was in a cast. I couldn't feed myself, I couldn't sit up. I had a colostomy bag because my bowels were injured. So I couldn't even go to the toilet on my own. I'd lost every every independent um, action. So, you know, it was it was certainly not lost on me that a few months before I got injured, I'd been looking after somebody and pushing them around in a wheelchair and, and feeding them. And a few months later, I was in exactly that same uh, situation. And it's humbling on both levels. I think it's something that everybody should have to do at some point is to to care for another on a very one to one basis because that is humanity at its and it's most naked. How did you go from caring for people in need to photographing people who needed, desperately needed care because they were victims of war and conflict? Photography will always be the most important thing in my life. But during that period when I was doing the care work for, for Nick, the young man with autism, photography was not part of my life. I smashed my cameras. I didn't have any cameras. I took no photographs. And then one day, you know, I was talking to, to Nick's family I say, Nick, he could express himself to me and to the people very close, to me, but he would also struggle just to have a normal conversation with somebody. So when he met doctors, when he met his psychologist, they never really got the extent of, of what he was going through. And one of the main issues he had was self-harming, where he would punch himself to the point of, of black eyes and bleeding nose and, and his face bleeding really violently. And we couldn't really get him the support that he needed. And as I say, when, we, when he tried to tell his story to people, they maybe didn't listen or it didn't come across. And that's when we had this kind of eureka moment. We suddenly went, well, why don't you, and his family asked me, take photographs of Nick's life? And you could document his life and we could tell his story that way. And I started to photograph Nick's daily life. And one day he allowed me to photograph him just after he'd been self-harming. And it's an incredibly um, disturbing image of blood rushing down his face and he's just looking straight at the camera. And I remember the next time we saw his healthcare professionals and the team that supported him, and we laid out these photographs in front of them. When they saw these images, these documents, 
they suddenly said, we've got to do more. We didn't realize it was that bad. And that's when I realized the power of the gift that I had. Photography had always been about doing beautiful pictures of, of models and bands and, and fashion. Now I realized it could change somebody's life. I realized that I could help people to tell their story through my images. And that's when everything clicked. My love of photography and what I'd found in my passion of helping others came together. And from that moment, it all made sense. So I moved to Angola. I went there because I had a friend that was working there with the UN and I based myself there and started working with local NGOs, trying to learn the skill of telling people stories. Because you also thought that not only would it help them to get people to pay attention to them, but also it would drive action. Absolutely. I mean, I, I set out not to be a photographer, but to try and create change through my photography. My concern right from the beginning was what happens to the civilian populations caught up in war. What happens to the people who are in a situation where a fight is going on around them? You know, I still think it's almost impossible to photograph wars without in some way glamorizing it. I know that from my own experience, because as a child, if I saw pictures from the Vietnam War or, you know, pictures from the Falklands, I saw it was cool. It was amazing. It was people with guns. You don't look at it and see the horror. And I realized that's what I had to do. My job was to try and show the real face of what conflict is and what it does to families, communities, individuals. You call yourself a, not a war photographer, but a love photographer. Why is that? Yeah, if the war photography label gets used, I'm always I'm an anti-war photographer. <laughs> you know, uh, that's that's my my main role. What I'm trying to capture is the essence of of humanity, the relationships of people, those little intimacies, those little moments that are universal to us all. So it doesn't matter whether you're in a mud tukul, a mud hut in in South Sudan, or if you're in a, a tent in in Jordan, if you're in a flat in Brixton in London. Within those walls, what you will see within a family will be identical. You'll see exactly the same moments happen. A mother feeding her baby, a father brushing his daughter's hair before she goes to school, uh, kids playing with each other, knocking each other over. It's, it's exactly the same anywhere. And more and more, that's what I focused on. And I focused on those little intimacies, those moments that we all relate to. Can you tell me what brought you to Afghanistan and what brought you to the place on that fateful day where you lost three of your limbs when a device exploded at your feet? I was in Afghanistan. I, you know, I've talked about the fact I'm not a war photographer. I was not interested in photographing people firing guns, but I was very interested in what was happening at, at that time. And that was that more American soldiers were killing themselves than were actually dying in Afghanistan. And I wanted to try and understand that. And as part of that, I was embedded with a group of American soldiers. You know, I spent a lot of my time around conflicts, especially in, in places like South Sudan, Angola. So it was something I was used to. And as I say, I wasn't actually interested in, in taking pictures of, of them shooting their guns. I was interested in what was happening in their downtime, what was happening in the evenings, what were the discussions going on. But we were on patrol one day and uh, we'd been under fire most of that week. It was getting quite tense where we were in, in Kandahar in Afghanistan. And on this particular day, in February 2011, we'd gone out on patrol, on a foot patrol, and we got ambushed. And as we were um, taking cover, that's when I stepped on an IED. There was just six of us on patrol. It was a very small patrol. I was the seventh person. Luckily, I was the only one injured. I remember it distinctly. I remember, I remember a sense of a click or something happening and then just being in the air. I don't remember a sound, but I remember a sense of, of heat just engulfing me, this white heat blinding and then landed with a thud on my side. I thought I had broken my back because I couldn't move, I couldn't sit up. I could see my legs had gone. There was just like a shard of bone remaining from my, my right leg. My, my left arm was kind of mangled and, and pretty much on fire. And, and my right hand was, was badly damaged as well. And I did think for a moment, I thought these are gonna be my last moments. You know, I, I've seen people with far less injuries succumb to them very quickly. I didn't feel a huge amount of pain. I was lying there on my back and I remember I was looking up at a tree and it was a beautiful, beautiful Afghan spring morning and, and there were birds singing and this blue sky. And I do remember thinking what a beautiful place to be my last moments. But then also thinking, no, you know, I'm not dying here in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm not going to be my end. Then the, the crew that was with me, the, the team, they got to me. They put some tourniquets on uh, to stop the bleeding. That was the first time I felt real pain. And I just remember thinking, well, that's quite a good thing. 
thought, if I'm feeling pain, that means maybe, you know, there's some life in me. And then I remember saying to myself, well, look, you know, I don't think you're going to make it, but I reckon you can keep going for two minutes. Two minutes is not a big challenge. So just focus on your breathing. Don't think about the things you can't do and try and focus on that. And it's, it's actually very strange looking back on it. A guy called Chris Metz was the sergeant leading the patrol and he was knelt down next to me. And, you know, he's recorded this about how we had a very normal conversation. We talked about American football. I asked him to make sure that my laptop was, was sent back to the UK. It was strangely a calm moment. I remember watching these helicopters coming in the valley that were coming to pick me up. And it was like a scene from a film. They were firing at their flares. And, and Chris even said to me, I don't really smoke, but he said, do you want a cigarette? And I thought, well, it's not going to do me much harm now. So he, he was kind of feeding me the cigarette. And so to say, it was like a scene from a film. And I was almost detached from it. I was then picked up, put on the back of this medivac helicopter. And I still uh, never lost consciousness. I was fully conscious for that, that journey back, a 20-minute flight back to Kandahar. But there were uh, the medics on the back, Chris Metz, Cole Reese, those guys and Phil. They were three people that, that I was sharing what I thought were the last moments of my life with. And we had a, a conversation. And I remember... There was a moment on that journey. And it's very interesting because they've been interviewed about that journey as well. And, and they recounted the same thing, but without knowing what I had said. And what I said is that on that journey, I was still doing this thing where I kept thinking, two minutes, okay, five minutes. You can do five minutes now. Keep alive for five minutes. Focus on your breathing. And people talk about flashbacks. And they talk about people remembering everything that's happened in their life. I had the opposite. I had these flash forwards. And I suddenly started thinking about the things I still needed to achieve, the work that I still wanted to do, the idea of having a family maybe one day. All these things were going through in my mind. And it was about halfway through the journey, and I remember feeling very calm then. And when Chris and CJ and, and these people were interviewed about that helicopter journey, they said it was really strange. They go, halfway through that flight, something changed, and all these signs went very stable. And they didn't even give me morphine because I was so stable and talking to them that they didn't even want to do anything that would upset that balance. So something magical that happened on that, that journey. You were able to control your destiny with your mind. I think I just, or certainly I was able to put myself into a very calm place. And, you know, it was a lesson I really learned throughout my life is that sometimes there's things you can't control and you can't focus on those things. Focus on things you can control. And I knew I couldn't control most of what was going on. The only thing I could control was keeping myself calm and breathing. We landed in Kandahar, and it's quite funny because as they were taking me out the back of the, the, the helicopter, I actually thanked everybody on the, uh, on the crew. And months later, when, when the crew got back in contact with me, they were like, they were going, who the hell says thank you? And I was like, well, I was British, you know, and my mother brought me up with good, good manners. <laughs> but they were trying to work out that, you know, who was this guy that was in a position to still say thank you? At that point in the UK, less than 20 people had survived a triple amputation by bomb blast. In fact, the first, the first soldier was only a couple of years before me. You know, I was a 40-year-old man that had gone through that. It was a miracle I survived that day. Nobody can really figure it out. Nobody can figure out how I was still talking and having conversations when we landed. I was just lucky that day. It just wasn't my day to go. When you were lying on the ground, realizing that you had been hit and that were, there were, your legs were missing, you also saw your body parts. Can you describe that scene? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to ever explain to anyone that, that hasn't seen anything like that. It's, it's beyond words, really. Um, it's interesting. It was actually photographed. There was a, a Canadian photographer embedded with the medevac crew that picked me up. So there were photographs taken moments after I was injured and actually film footage of the guys with the, the helmet cams filmed the whole journey. So, you know, I've seen the whole of this footage. I've seen the photographs of it. And I still feel slightly detached from it. It's slightly... Um, alien to me but it, but it, it it's beyond imagination you know to see to see your legs gone and they they had gone in a in a terrible way so it was it was beyond shocking you you can't you can't process that information but what i knew what i knew straight away was that my life was never going to be the same that this was not going to be an injury that i was ever going to recover from there was no way my legs were coming back my arm was obviously terribly damaged i thought both my hands might be gone i do remember thinking about the fact that i could still see and thinking, well, if I can still see, I can still be a photographer, I can still, you know, do that. Um, but it was, it was, I knew, life-changing. I knew from that moment on, nothing would ever be the same. And when you woke up in the hospital, how did you react? Well, I was, I was flown back to the UK, and then I went to a hospital in, in Birmingham, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And actually, that was, that was still touch and go. There was 46 days then in intensive care. You know, my brother and sister sat by my bed 24 
hours a day because they were told at any moment I could go. Again, that was a series of miracles. You know, at various points, my lungs stopped working, my kidneys stopped working. Everything gave up at some point. At one point, my body was overheating so much, they didn't know what to do. They were putting literally blocks of ice around my body. Some bright spark came up with the idea of, of connecting me to a transfusion machine um, and connecting that to a freezer element out of a domestic freezer so that it was taking my blood out and virtually cooling it and putting it back in me. They were, they were trying everything they could. At so many points, they would say to my family, look, there's nothing else we can do, but we got this crazy idea, we got this, and they would do it. And every, every time, somehow, you know, I would still be going. I was conscious a lot of that time. I couldn't communicate because my hand was in a cast. I had a trachotomy and so I could, I could blink to communicate. But I remember it all. And, you know, we, t- we talk about injury and pain, but there's something else and, and something deeper, and that's suffering. And those 46 days, actually, a university in the States contacted me to do some research because it's, it's one of the longest stays in, in intensive care. And they actually equated, they were doing a study on the similarities between that and torture. Because when you're in intensive care, the lights never go off. There's a constant sound. You have no awareness of time or day. Because normally, you know, a stay is maximum of a day or two days. Because literally in intensive care, they're fighting to save your life. So it's not, there's no quiet moments. There's always somebody pushing something in, pumping something in. It's a constant process. And as I say, you become very confused because there's no day or night. It's lights on 24-7, bright lights. There's this constant noise, this constant fear because you don't know what they're going to do to you next. They're not explaining things to you because, again, it's an emergency situation. And they call it intensive care psychosis that, that can happen after a few days. And so 46 days, I lay there going through that. And that's just that's, that's something that is more life-changing than my injuries were or anything else. That is a, a time when, when the days, the, the hours, the minutes just go on and you're, you're scared. You think you're dying. You are dying. And you see it in the people's faces, the panic and people rushing around. You can't have visitors. You can't have anything. You have no control of your own body. You know, you don't feed yourself. That comes, food comes in through a tube. There's no food. You know, you don't drink water. You can't go to the toilet on your own. And 46 days is a long, long time of that. And that's something that, that really... My personality and who I am today was, was forged in that experience. How? Strength. You know, I, I, I left that thinking I'm unbreakable. You know, I left that thinking that, that I could confront any challenge in my life. I, I left that thinking that, that the years of depression, the years of other challenges, all were put into perspective. And I did have that sense that the people that I document, the people that I work with who have suffered, that I had some idea of what they meant when they told me about suffering, that I really actually had for a moment kind of stepped in a living hell that many people are stuck in their whole lives. And that was a gift, an insight that very few people have. Very few people really have have gone to that point. And do you have any pain from your injuries? Oh, I'm in agony. I mean, pain pain is, is, is... it's terrible. I mean, you know, to use the prosthesis. I mean, it's not something I ever really talk about. I don't think it's 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 relevant on a daily basis to talk about. But but yeah, pain pain is sometimes overwhelming. You know, you, you get different pain. My, my legs bruise. You get blisters. They bleed. Doing the work I do, I, I know I push myself way beyond normal limits. So every every day at the end of a, a day working in the field, I'm in so much discomfort. My left arm is, is constant agony. I call that like a toothache pain, that throbbing pain um, from the nerve damage in the arms. Yeah, my bowel injuries still hurt. But, you know, early on, somebody said to me, a, a nurse said, you have a choice. She said, you're going to be in terrible pain for the whole of your life. You either choose a way of, of medication, but the medication would be morphine and very strong based. Or she said, you own that pain and you make that pain your own. And, and that's the, the route that I chose. So, you know, I take no painkillers or, or medication and, and I've just taken it as an acceptance. Pain, you know, we see pain as an external thing. Pain is caused to you. But actually pain is our body sending us messages. We control that pain. It's actually us interpreting electric signals that are sent to our brain. So, you know, what, what I tried to do right from an early 
point was just keep saying, okay, thank you, I got the message, thank you, I got the message, thank you, I got the message, and repeating that. And I can't say that it means that I don't feel it. Of course I do. And and my friends laugh, you know, I'll catch my fingernail and I'll be screaming like blue murder or, you know, I'll be like catch myself on a piece of paper and get a little cut and be like, ah. So, you know, I still complain about the silly things. But the the general pain that I feel each day, it's part of me now. And that's helped me to deal with it. But yeah, I mean, I, I if I had one one gift, one dream, it would be to spend one day without pain. I mean, you've spent a lot of time recently photographing refugees. Why refugees? In 2014, three years after I was injured, is when I was really able to, to return to full-time work. And the first story I did was of Syrian refugees living in Lebanon, and really the most vulnerable refugees, so single-parent families, the elderly, and those living with disabilities. Doing those stories was was transforming for me. There were two in particular. One was of a woman, Khalud, who was paralyzed by a sniper's bullet. And the other was a young girl called Aya, um, who, when I met her, she was living in this tent that was very damp and, and wet. It was a makeshift tent. And she had spina bifida. Um, she was four years old, so she couldn't even sit up on her own. And I thought, if I take a photograph, she's just going to look like a, a victim. But I said to the team I was with, I said, well, I'd like to spend the day at least and, and just be here and get to know the family. And what I discovered is, is, is this girl, Aya, was not a victim. She's actually the feistiest four-year-old I've ever met in my life. And she didn't just run her family, she ran the whole refugee camp. You know, everyone was referred to as Donkey, and she'd be like, hey, Donkey, do this, pick me up, and travel around. And she was an incredible spirit. And eventually, the, the photograph I took of her was her with her sister playing hopscotch. And it's a really joyful photograph. I think in many ways, in those camps, I felt a sense of liberation almost. And I always say that the doctors, the surgeons, the nurses, they, they saved my life physically. They got me going. My family was there to support me. But everybody, everybody questioned me whether I could work again. Nobody believed it. I remember one of the darkest moments was actually coming out of hospital. I'd lost everything. I lost my home. I was bankrupt. I got no payouts, no support for getting injured. I was living in a bedsit in South London. There was mold on the walls. I'd broken up with my fiance, I was on my own. I had nothing, and no work, nothing was coming in. And I really didn't know what I was gonna do. And I was supported to finally go back and do this story in, in Lebanon of the Syrian refugees. And these families, like Ayah's family and Khalud's family, they didn't look at me and think he can't do his job. They trusted me with their stories. They let me tell their stories. And when that work was published, is when people started commissioning me again to work. So I always say it was those Syrian refugees, the families of Aya and Khalud, of Reem and many others, they were the ones that gave me my life back. And so that's why my commitment to telling the stories of refugees is a personal one, because I owe them everything. Because without them, I would not be able to be a photographer. I would not be back telling stories. Giles, I have to say, listening to you is extraordinarily inspiring. What is it that keeps you hopeful? I guess one of my favorite moments in my life was about a year after I was injured, um, going to my sister's house. And I had spent most of that year in hospital beds. I had not seen any fresh air, nothing. And this may sound really cliche, but I remember sitting in my sister's garden and feeling the sun on my face, feeling the breeze, my friends came around, we drank some wine, we had some food, my sister's a great cook, my nephews were running around, and everything was so precious. And I do believe that that is, I mean, I talk a lot about gifts that I've been given, but that was the greatest gift, was to appreciate life more than I ever had. And these smallest things, to me, bring me so much happiness. I think I'm lucky. I may be the luckiest man in the world. And people always think, oh, really? And I'm like, no, I am because I get to appreciate life more than anyone else does. I get every single moment, even if I'm sat in a traffic jam, I'm grateful for that. Even if something upsets me, I'm like, I'm grateful that I can feel sadness. Everything is amazing when it's taken away from you and you have it given back. You know, through my work, again, it's, it's exactly that same thing that, that I get to share these stories with people going through really terrible experiences. But the amount of times we're, we're laughing and, you know, we'll be in a, in a house that's, that's bombed family that's been devastated, but there'd be laughter and people sort of telling these stories and there's always hope. But with all that you see covering 
people who are the victims of war, who have lost everything, who might still have love, but still have so much loss. What is it that keeps you awake at night? You know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I see hope and I, I get to have these amazing experiences with the people I document and I get to appreciate life myself. But there are times, of course, when when you see the madness of war, there is no greater waste of human endeavor than war. And there are times when I want to throw my camera away because pointing a camera at a war seems the most futile act you can possibly do. How can I stop what is happening by taking a single image? But the thing that really keeps me awake at night, the thing I really struggle with is when somebody shares their story with me and somebody has told me about their experiences and they've trusted me with that story. And I still have it and it hasn't been published or it hasn't been heard or hasn't been told anywhere. And until I can do that, that keeps me awake at night, that sense of responsibility to the people whose stories have been entrusted to me. Thanks for listening to Awake at Night. Find out more about the series and see Giles' photographs by visiting unhcr.org slash awake at night. Find us on Facebook at UNHCR, and on Twitter, we're at Refugees, and I'm at Melissa R. Fleming. You can also follow Giles on at Giles Dooley. Please do spread the word about the series using hashtag Awake at Night. Thanks to Alex Court and the fantastic design and studio teams here at UNHCR, and to my producers, Bethany Bell, and also Laura Sheeter of Chalk and Blade. The original music for this podcast was written and performed by Nadine Shaw and produced by Ben Hillier. Nadine's latest album, Holiday Destination, is inspired by the Syrian refugee crisis, and it's incredible. My guest next week is an extraordinary man of incredible charm who says that a real humanitarian has to be part cowboy, part lawyer, and part nun. <laughs>